Amen. Thank God I'm on the winning side. Yeah. Amen. We was talking about that in Sunday school. I mentioned that in teenage Sunday school this, this morning. A little too loud, Brother D'Angelo. I mentioned that in Sunday school this morning about being on the winning side. And uh, you know what? When you was born in this world, you was lost. You was Nobody was born saved, by the way. You was born lost. And when you got saved, you went from the devil's team to God's team. You know what? If I ever played, if when I played sports, if I was on... Uh, the, the, the winning team or the losing team I didn't like nobody that was on the winning team you know when you move from the losing team to the winning team you got on the Lord's side there's a devil on that, that other team that hates your guts he can't stand you and we talked about how the devil tried to wear you out in this Christian life and you just better be careful he tried to do it a little bit at a time slip in and he'll just, send, he'll just wear you out that's what he said in Daniel chapter 7 verse 25 he said he wore, he'll wear out the saints of the most high be careful Matthew chapter number 27 Matthew chapter number 27. I won't be long. We'll go get some cake and ice cream. Matthew chapter number 27. Good singing tonight, choir. Wasn't too bad. First practice we had in about two years. Wasn't too bad. We already got, hey, we already got booked for a revival. It ain't no joke. We got about two and a half weeks, so we better tighten up a little bit. But it was pretty good tonight. Matthew chapter number 27. Sometimes you got to have faith, but sometimes you got to be smart, too. I should have practiced before now. But Matthew chapter 27. Good, anyhow, I'm glad I'm on the winning side. If you're not, you can get on that side tonight, I promise you. It don't take but, a, but an instant, you can be switched sides. Matthew chapter number 27. You know what, sometimes you play pickup basketball, you get on the losing side and you stuck there all day long. Because the winner, most of the time the winning side keeps the court and they might just keep on winning. You can't never get on the winning side. But if you're here and you're lost, you don't have to be stuck on the losing side. You can get put, you can get put on the winning side tonight. Matthew chapter number 27, verse 57. Matthew 27, verse number 57. The Bible says, When the even was come, there came a rich man of, Ar of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and he laid it in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. And there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary sitting over against the sepulcher. Now the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deliverer said while he was yet alive, after three days... I will rise again, deceiver, excuse me, that deceiver, they called him a deceiver. He is a deliverer, he's not a deceiver. It says, after three days I will rise again. Verse 64, command therefore that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day, lest his disciples come by night and steal him away, and saying to the people, he is risen from the dead, so the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, you have a watch, go your way, make it as sure as as you can. I like that phrase right there. Make it as sure as you can. Verse 66, So they went and made the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Brother Nolan, you pray for us tonight. Amen. Amen. This is a very great passage of Scripture here, and by way of introduction, we'll hit some verses through here. But I like that phrase, make it as sure as you can. You know what? If you're here and you're lost, you need to make salvation as sure as you can. Hey, if you're here and you're saved, it's good to... Hey, you know what? It's great to be saved, but it's great to know that I'm saved. Yeah. You remember that day? You remember the time? Some of you might have got the assurance of your salvation as soon as you got, you got saved and you knew without a shout out you were saved. And, you, and, and I was like that, but then some, you let a sin or you let something get in and you get that assurance. You get back in your Bible and you get that assurance of your salvation. You know without a shadow of a doubt you're saved. Hey, that's about as good as it, as, as it is getting saved, knowing that I'm saved. But make it as sure as you can. Hey, I thank God this passage of Scripture is talking about where they laid the Lord in the grave and I'm glad the story don't end there. I'm glad he didn't stay in the grave. Hey, I'm here to report tonight that he got up. Yeah. 
The songwriter said, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph o'er his foe. Hey, he arose a victor of the dark domain and he lives forever with his saint serene. Hey, thank God I don't serve a dead savior. Hey, up from the grave he arose. Hey, I'm glad the gospel don't end after the death and burial. You know what? If it ended after death and burial, me and me and you wouldn't have no hope. Hey, we'd be of all men most miserable, but he got up. Hey, thank God it don't end there. This, uh, there's a song said, but he did. Thank God he rose again from the grave and he lived forevermore. You know, there's plenty of people that, uh, 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 several people in the Bible, you can find it in, in history and studying your Bible where the Lord rose in from the dead. Think about Lazarus right off of that uh, hand. Lazarus got up. But you know what? Lazarus died again. He's back in the grave somewhere. His bones done rotted by now. You know what? This man, this Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, he got up and he ain't never died again and never will die again. He's living forevermore, sitting at the right hand of the Father right now, making intercession for me and you. Hey, he got up and he's never, ever going to die again. I thank God I serve a risen Savior. Hey, you know what? When he was in this grave, when he was buried, hey, he was busy. Hey, you know what? If you, go in, if you die and go in that grave, <laughs> you're going to be in heaven or hell. One, one of the two, there's no, there's no uh, purgatory, there's no in-between. You die, the Bible says, be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. You can, you're going to either be in heaven or in hell. When the Lord Jesus Christ died for me and you, the, and uh, he was buried, you know what? His, his soul, his body was in the dirt, but his soul went to hell for me and you. He said in Acts chapter 2, verse 27, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Hey, he literally took your hell. Hey, the Lord Jesus Christ, he didn't just take your pain and your suffering and your sin on that cross. When he died on that cross, he literally took your hell. He literally went to hell for you. Hey, he went, and you know what he did? He went to hell and kicked the devil in the mouth, took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, went over to uh, ca uh, uh, paradise, preached captivity to the captive, to the uh, saints in paradise, and led captivity captive. He done all this while, while his body was in the grave. Hey, he was busy when he was in the grave, but I thank God he didn't just stay in the grave. He didn't go to hell and stay there for me. Hey, no, he went, paid our sin debt, paid our death in hell, kicked the devil in the mouth, got the keys, and he's back up and got into heaven forevermore uh, uh, interced, inter, interceding for me and you. Hey, thank God he didn't stay dead, and then he won't stay gone, the songwriter said. Hey, you know what? These keepers right here, the, he said, Pilate told him, he said, uh, let's see, where is it? Verse uh, 65, Pilate said unto them, You have a watch. He said, You have a watch. Go your way. Make it as sure as you can. Hey, you know what? These, these, this, these keepers right here at the tomb, I, I can see them now standing there with a, uh, some kind of amp gun, sword. They probably had no gun. They probably had a sword, something. They standing there, something, ready to stop something. Because they thought somebody, some of the Lord's disciples, was going to come and try to get in this tomb and get the Lord and say, Well, he done got up. Because they heard that story before. They thought it was going to come happen. But you know what? They weren't ready for what they seen. They set a watch. They was looking, but they weren't expecting to see what they seen when they were on their watch. Hey, they seen something more. Look at verse 1 of chapter 28. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. I can see these dudes now standing there. I don't know what they had, but I guarantee they had something. And they standing there waiting on somebody to come, and then they hear an earthquake, and here comes something down from above, and he rolls that stone away and just sat on that stone looking at them. <laughs> I bet they weren't expecting that. I mean, he just sat there like, was this what you came to see? No, them, do them dudes got a show they weren't looking for. Hey, they weren't looking for that. The Bible says his countenance was lightning, was like lightning, and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake. I mean, it shook them up. But look what the Bible says, and, and became as dead men. Here's, live, here's real live men guarding a dead man. And when this man, this, uh, the angel of the Lord comes and rolls the stone back, here's a, there, there was a dead man on the inside of the stone that got up and he's alive. Now these live men are dead. Or like they became as dead men. Hey, they, they weren't expecting to see what they seen, but I thank God they seen something that day that gave me a new hope. They seen something that, that day that, hey, because he got up, because he's the first fruit from the grave, me and you are going to get up. Hey, thank God he, he's alive forevermore. Hey, these guys... They, they were just they were expecting just some regular guys to come, come get that body. They weren't expecting what they seen in verse 2. They weren't expecting that. But look at verse, uh, let's see, verse, I believe it's verse 59. Yeah, look at verse 59 and verse 60, where we'll get our thought from tonight. Verse 59, the Bible says, And when Jesus, 
And when, excuse me, Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Look at this phrase. And laid it in his own new tomb. So here's Joseph. Here's the, the Lord Jesus Christ paid our sin debt. And the things he went through on Calvary, you can't even hardly, hardly wrap your mind around it, what he went through on that cross for me and you. The sin debt he paid, the, the Bible said in the, in the book of Psalms, the bulls of Bashan can pass him about. I mean, he went through some ungodly things, laid there, hung on that cross between heaven and earth, naked for me and you, took our shame, took our sin, and here's his body. And Joseph, Joseph went to Pilate and Joseph said, hey, I want the body. He craved the body of Jesus. You can find where it says that in an, another gospel. And he begged the body of Jesus. He got the body and he took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and the Bible says he laid it in his own new tomb. And I want to preach on this thought tonight, and I won't be long. I want to preach on this thought. Can God have your tomb? Can God have your tomb? Here's Joseph. Joseph had his future plan all planned out. Joseph done had his tomb. I mean, I don't know. How many of you here already got a grave plot? There's, there's a few. There's a few. They already, you already got it planned out. You got your future planned out. Joseph had this thing planned out. I don't know how long he had this tomb, but it was his own new tomb. The Bible says a new one, never been used. Joseph had this tomb, and you know what? Joseph let the Lord have that tomb. You know what that's the type of t this tonight? That's the type of your, his future. Can the Lord have your future tonight? Can the Lord have your future plans? Here's Joseph. He had his future all planned out, where he was going to lay when he died, what tomb they was going to put him in. He had it planned out. I, I, he might have had a wheel. I don't know. He had this thing planned out, and here's the Lord, the one he's following, died on the cross, and Joseph said, hey, he's going, they, they're going to have to bury him somewhere. Joseph said, hey, here, use mine. Use mine. Hey, you know what? Tonight the Lord wants your future. Hey, here's, he's here tonight. You might have some plans. You might have it all planned out. You got it all figured out how you're going to live your life, how you're going to go here and there. You're going to go here and go there and do this and do that. But the Lord might want to interrupt your plans. He might want your tomb tonight. He might want your future. Hey, I'm here to tell you he does want your future. He wants him, he wants him to be in your future tonight. Hey, Joseph had it all figured out. Hey, you know what? He, he, he already had it paid for. Hey, you know what he did? He gave it to God. He gave God his future. Joseph gave God his future. Three things tonight. Three things tonight. Number one, it takes faith. Here's a man, Joseph, and he's seen what they just done to the Lord, how they just killed him and, and destroyed him. They hated his guts. That Jewish people, they hated the Lord Jesus Christ, the one that died for your soul. They couldn't stand him. I mean, they took Barabbas over him. Barabbas was a known robber and a known murderer, and they chose him to go free and let the one that ain't done nothing but healed the sick raised the dead, healed the blind. They said, hey, kill him. Kill him. They hated him. They couldn't stand him, and he didn't do nothing wrong. So here's Joseph. He said, hey, look, I'll be, I'll be numbered with him. You know what? That takes faith. It took faith for Joseph to say, hey, put him in my tomb. Put him in my tomb. Number me with him. Hey, I'm with him. He's with me. I'm with, I'm with that man. That man that you just killed that ain't done nothing wrong. Hey, it took, no doubt it took faith for Joseph to say, hey, you can have my tomb. Hey, you know what? If you're here tonight, the Lord wants your future. It's going to take some faith. It's going to take some faith, young people, to put your future in God's hand. It's going to take some faith to say, hey, God, I don't know what you got in store. I don't know what you got planned, but here's my life. Do what you want to with it. Hey, here's Joseph. He gave the Lord his tomb. He didn't, you know what? Joseph, he, he had no clue what God was going to do with his tomb. I mean, he heard him say, and the, and the disciples heard the Lord say, he'd destroy this temple in three days, he'd raise it up again. But none of them understood it. None of them. And here's Joseph, and I, don't, I, I beg to differ. He probably didn't understand it either. So he said, hey, Lord, here, you can have it. Joseph had no clue what the Lord was. You know what? If you give the Lord your future, you give the Lord your life, there's no telling what he can do with it. There's no telling what he can do with it. Hey, it's going to take faith to give God your future in this life. Hey, you know what? When you got saved, when you got born again, you put your faith and your future in God. You know what, your eternity, you're going to spend eternity somewhere. That's your future. Eternity is out there somewhere. It's future. You know what, if you're here and you're saved, you put your faith and your future in God's hands. Why can't we put our future in this life in God's hands? We can trust God with our soul. That's the most valuable thing you got, your soul. The Bible says, what shall a man give in exchange for a soul? Hey, the soul of man is the most valuable thing on this earth. And we, got, we put our faith in God. We trust him with our soul. But a lot of times, we, I say we because that means me too, we have the problem of putting our faith in God in this life. We say, God, well, I know what I was shouted out. I'm saved. I know you can handle that. But here's my life. And I just I don't know if I can do that. God, I don't know if I can take that step of faith right there. 
I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do that. It's going to take faith tonight to give God your tomb, to give God your future. Hey, future, excuse me, it took faith. Hey, you give God your future and there's no telling what he might do with it. Hey, you, we trust God with our soul. Why can't we trust him with our life? Look in John chapter 6. John chapter number 6. Hey, God wants your future tonight. If you're hearing your loss, God wants your future. He don't want you to die and, and burn in hell. The Bible says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John Calvin was a liar. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But if you're here and you're saved, God wants your future in this life. He wants your plans in this life. He wants your desires in this life. Hey, he wants you to live a life pleasing unto him. He wants you to go out and be an example in this life for, uh, for him. He wants you to live for him in this life. Uh, John chapter 6, verse 9. We all know this story. We'll just read verse 9. We might read one more verse. But the Bible says, There is a lad, he, there, uh, there is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the men sit down. Now there was grass in that place, so the men sat down in number about above 5,000. And we won't read the story, but here's where the Lord came, and we all, I'm sure all of us know it. And by the way, they were in a desert place, and the Lord said, Sat down, and they sat down in grass. So there's another miracle right there. You try to get, I mean, it's hard to get grass growing in this sand in the sand hills. It's a desert. And they got grass, and the Lord got grass and made them dudes sit on grass. But here's a little boy, and here's his lunch. His mama prepared for him. His mama prepared his lunch. And you know what this lunch was? He wasn't, he wasn't eating that. He ain't eating lunch at breakfast time. He got this lunch and left out that morning, and that lunch was for the future, for down the road, later on that day. And here he comes, not knowing what he's going to come up on, not one, knowing what he's going to come to. And here he comes, and he finds the Lord here, and the Lord's looking for somebody with a little bit of faith. And the Lord said, hey, here, he, the little lad said, hey, you can have my lunch. I bet somebody, hey, that's his future. That's what he, his mama planned for him. That's what his plans in life, he gave his future plans to God. He put it in God's hands. I bet there was somebody there said, man, you see all these people. What's that little bit going to do? What's that going to do? Hey, I don't know, but a little bit with God can do a lot. A little bit with God can do a whole lot. Who was it said God, God, one man in God it equals the majority? Hey, I don't care how many's on the other side. One man in God is going to outnumber them every single time. Hey, this little boy gave God his future plans. It took faith. No doubt. No doubt it took faith for him to give God his lunch. Hey, it took doubt. It took faith. Hey, it, it, it don't look like much. And really, honestly, I mean, there's 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. Five loaves and two fishes. It don't look like much. You know why? Because it ain't much. I mean, just simply put, it ain't five loaves and two fishes wouldn't feed us tonight. It wouldn't hardly feed me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And here's this boy, and it, it don't look like much because it ain't much. But say, well, what, what's the difference in the story? God showed up. But God. Hey, it don't look like much, and it ain't much, but here, here stepped God in, and he done another miracle that we still talk about today because a little boy gave God his future. Because a little boy put his future in God's hands. You know what? God wants your future tonight. He wants your future plans. Number one, it's going to take faith. Number two, you're going to have some fear. Say, what's that mean? It ain't going to be easy. It's not going to be easy to hit an old-fashioned altar and say, God, here's my life, here's my future, do exactly what you want to with it. You know what he might do? Some of you probably heard about it this weekend. He might want you to go to Haiti. Y'all hear about that missionary and his wife? I believe they was in their 30s in Haiti with all that junk's going on in Haiti with those gangs and they got killed, both of them, over the weekend. That ain't easy. That ain't easy. But, I, but you know what? This, those, that missionary, that couple made a, uh, I guarantee you they made a promise to God I don't know, it might have been two, three, five years ago, and they put their hand, their future in God's hands, not knowing what it was going to come to, and that's what happened. Say, I don't understand that. Hey, God knows. God knows, but what I'm trying to say tonight, if you put your future in God's hand, you're going to have to overcome some fear. It's going to be scary. It's going to be scary not knowing what your future holds and putting it in God's hand. Hey, God, whatever you want to do, you do what you want to with it. Hey, he didn't know what would happen if they seen him with Jesus' body. Here's Joseph. He said, hey, I want that body. Look in John chapter 19. John chapter 19. Here's another, it's another uh, uh, passage about the, uh, another account in, in this uh, gospel of John of the same thing that's happened here. 
And here's what the way John seen it. And you can find in uh, Matthew and Luke, he just simply says he graved the body, he begged the body. And here in John, we'll see what he says. But in Mark, the Bible says he, he, uh, he, uh, Joseph boldly went in and said, hey, give me that body. And here's, here's John, this way John seen it with John's eyes. John 19, verse 38, the Bible says, And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him leave. He came, therefore, and took the body of Jesus. So you know what? Joseph had to overcome fear. Joseph had to overcome fear to give God his future. There's no t here's a man that he hated and they just killed. They couldn't stand him. And here's Joseph fixing to, he's fixing to put himself in the boat with this man when he goes and gets his body. You know, what, who, you know who buries you when you die? You know who your pallbearers are? Usually it's the closest people to you. It's people close in your life, me and close in your life, usually how it works. And here's Joseph, and he's a pallbearer, if you will. He goes and gets the body and puts it in his tomb. He gives God his future, and he's numbered with this man that they hate and they just killed. There's no telling what they might do to Joseph if they see him with this body. There's no telling what might happen uh, to Joseph when they see him with the Lord's body. But you know what? He wanted the Lord to have his future. He wanted the Lord to have his tomb. You know what? Joseph's the only one that gave the Lord his tomb. Now, I guarantee you there was a bunch of people there that day that had a tomb future planned out, and nobody else spoke up and said, hey, you can have my tomb. It's just Joseph. That's the only kind we see. Joseph was the only one that said, hey, put him in my tomb. Put him in my place. Put him in my future. Put him in my plans. Put him in my life. Hey, God wants to be in your plans tonight. God wants to be in your future. Hey, he wanted the Lord to have his tomb. It's a scary thing to say, God, here's my life. You can have my future. You, you can take it. You can have it. But you know what? It's going to it's gonna take some faith because you're going to have to overcome fear. And faith is the best way to overcome fear. Faith is the best way to overcome fear. Joseph was the only one who ever, who ever gave God their tomb. Hey, there, there was a bunch of people that had a tomb, but Joseph trusted God in spite of the fear. Joseph trusted God in spite of the fear. He let his faith prevail over his fear. Hey, if you're going to give God your future tonight, you're going to come down and say, hey, you know what? I don't care how old you are. Joseph... The few people that raised their hand tonight that said they had a, a, a grave plot already, were most of them were older people. Joseph might have been older here. I don't know how old Joseph was. Joseph might have been 50, 60 years old. I'm not just preaching to young people tonight. Hey, if you're 50, 60, 70, God wants your future. He wants what you got left. He wants your future plans. He wants you to put your life and your future in God's hand. Joseph trusted God in spite of the fear and in spite of, the, of what might happen to him, in spite of the trouble, he trusted God and he let his faith prevail over his fear. Number three, lastly, number one, it's going to take faith. Number two, you'll have to overcome fear. And number three, he'll return the favor. Here's Joseph. Lord died. Joseph said, hey, put him in my tomb. Here's his tomb. He said, put him in my tomb. And you know what? Three days later, Joseph got that tomb back. Lord got up. He got that tomb back. Hey, you give God your life, there's no telling what he'd do with your life. He'll turn around and give it. Yeah, I know you've heard testimony after testimony where, and Daddy says all the time, where a, a country boy from the sticks didn't have nothing, gets to travel the world and preach the gospel. Why? Because he gave God his life, and God turned around and gave it right back to him. Hey, you give God your life, God's might, God might let you do something you, you never dreamed you could do. Hey, here's Joseph, and he gave the Lord his tomb, and three days later, he got that thing back. He got, God gave his future back. And, and, but it was a lot different than what it was before he gave it to him. And we'll see that in a minute. It was a lot different. God gave Joseph his tomb back. Hey, you give God your future, and he'll give you a life you could never dream of. Hey, he'll give you something you could never, you couldn't even fathom it. You couldn't even think about the life God, God could make out of you, what God could do with you if you give him your future, if you give him your tomb tonight. Hey, you know what? Joseph got his tomb back, and everybody knew Three days later, three days later when Joseph got that thing back, everybody knew God had been there. Everybody. There was no doubting that somebody, some higher power, somebody different than Joseph had been in that tomb. That wasn't Joseph laid in that tomb. God had been there. You know what? People still go to Joseph's tomb today. You know why? Because God showed up in that tomb one day. You know what? You give God your life, you might be remembered for years to come. You know what? And even if you're not, it's not about you. It's just about you giving God your life, giving God your future, giving God your tomb. Hey, just because one man gave God his future, we're talking about it 2,000 plus years later. Because here's a man 
that had his future all in his hands, had his future planned up, his life, and he said, you know what? God needs this right now more than me. God needs my future. God wants my future. God wants to use my future. God, Joseph gave God his future and God gave it back. Hey, you know what? When he got it back, you could tell God had been there. You know why? You know what? You can, you can read it. I encourage you to go home and read it. You can read these passages, uh, accounts of this in the Gospels. And Joseph, and I, there was another uh, disciple that helped him in, in, in one of the Gospels that's given, where they went and they, uh, there's a bug right there. I about got him. Anyhow, Joseph, uh, Joseph and this other disciple, they went and they anointed this body. They anointed the body of Jesus with, some, with uh, myrrh and all and this stuff. You can, you, can, you can study it. And I guarantee you three days later when Joseph rolled back up and they said, Here's his, it's his tomb again, that thing smelled different. You know why? That anointing that they put on the Lord, that aroma was still in that place. You know what? You give God your future. You give God your life. You get, let God move in. You give him your future plans and lay it in God's hands. You'll smell different. I ain't saying not stink no more. You smell different to the world. You can study that about having a sweet smell and savor to the world. You'll smell different. You'll, it'll look different. It'll look like, man, somebody's been here before. Somebody's been here before. Uh, look in uh, John chapter 6. John chapter 6. We was just there a minute ago, John chapter 6. Same story with this little boy in five loaves. And I seen this one day and it thrilled my soul, John chapter 6. Look at verse, let's see, verse 12 and 13. Here's the story of the little boy. He gave the Lord his lunch. And verse 12, when they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Verse 13. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves which remained and above under them that had eaten. So here's this uh, little boy gave God his lunch and they had twelve baskets full left over. You know what that shows me? Somebody showed up that day with twelve empty baskets. Here's Joseph. He gave the Lord an empty tomb. And somebody rolled up that day with twelve empty baskets. You know what? That's somebody was expecting God to do something. They was expecting God. You know what? Your basket might be empty tonight, but you bring it to God, he might fill it up and empty it again. But you know what will be different in, about it? It will be used. Here's Joseph back in our text. Joseph, the Bible says, verse 60, back in our text, and laid it in his own, the Bible says, new tomb. So it was his own, this is a new, brand new tomb. Just brand new. And Joseph gave it to the Lord, and three days later, it's empty just like it was when he gave it to the Lord. But you know what the difference is? That thing was used now. You catch that? It was used. It wasn't new no more. Hey, you know what? You give God your life, he will use you. Joseph had a new tomb. He let God have it. He gave God his future. gave God his tomb. And next thing you know, God used that thing. Hey, that thing was used of God. It wasn't new no more. Hey, it might, it's still empty. Hey, you might. Hey, you know what? God did not promise you physical blessings. All the physical blessings you find in this Bible are to the children of Israel. He promised you spiritual blessings, but he didn't promise you no physical blessings. So your basket might look empty, but, it can, but if you give it to God, it can be used of God. Empty or full, it don't matter. Here's, these people showed up, 12 people showed up with an empty basket, but when that, that basket left that day, it was used. Joseph gave God his empty tomb. He gave God his future. He let God have his life, let God have his future plans, and God used it. Hey, if you're here, you're here tonight, God wants your future. Hey, God wants what you got. Say, well, I don't have much left. Hey, it don't matter what you got left. Just give it to God. Hey, it, you might have years to come. You, who knows? You might have five, you might have ten months, ten minutes. Whatever you got, God wants it. God wants your future tonight. He wants your plan. Can God have your tomb? Here's Joseph, in a, and there was multitudes there that day, no doubt. I guarantee there's plenty of people that had a tomb had their future planned out, and Joseph was the only one that spoke up and said, hey, God, you can have mine. Hey, if you're here tonight, God wants your future. Hey, if you're lost, you need to be born again. You need to get saved and, and let him move in your life and save your soul and change your life. But if you're here, and I'm talking to the saved people here tonight, God wants your future plans. God wants your tomb. Hey, God wants whatever you got left. He wants it. He wants it. Hey, you know what? It's going to take faith. It's going to take faith to lay your life and lay your hands in God, in God's hands. Say, hey, here's my life. Here's my tomb. Here's my future. Do whatever you want to with it. You're going to have to overcome some fear. 
but God will return the favor. Hey, God gave that thing back. Hey, God will use you if you'll let him. Every head bowed and every eye closed tonight. God will use you if you'll let him. Whatever.